Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Throughout this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, in today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Norfolk County Mayor Amy Martin. But before we get into that, we want to take a moment and thank our newest subscriber to the show. We'd like to thank Angie from Alberta. Without your support, we couldn't be doing the show. If you want to become one of our backers, please visit crossborderinterviews.ca and click on the support the show link now. Now, on to our interview. Mayor Martin, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me today. Greatly appreciate it. Before we get started, I have a question that I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception to that, Amy. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Good question. Oh, gosh. Well, it's probably cyclical because I think, honestly, a large portion of it just came from my community, the nature of my community. Everybody is civically minded. Everybody's volunteering and participating and has some level of involvement on something. So um, born and raised in a culture where everybody just gets to work on what they're passionate about. Um, but I guess uh, I'll, I'll go with the safe answer. I, I think probably my mom and dad. My, my mom always encouraged us to do more and participate and, you know, participate in kind acts every single day and bring up the neighbor's blue boxes when you get off the school bus and little gestures like that, volunteering in the community. Um, and my dad worked in the healthcare industry and was kind of, uh, kind of a trailblazer in what he did and um, very hardworking, very committed to uh, work, which was helping people in the community. And I can remember being a young kid and uh, doing home visits with him. We'd get in the car. He had one of those really old cell phones. It was like in a suitcase and you had to like, when the cell phone rang, you had to move because he would pull it up so hard. You might get an elbow in the car and uh, take a call and somebody would need him. And we'd drive across Norfolk County and go help that person. Um, you know, so I, I think probably my parents. Were they political? No, um, funny <laughs> enough, neither, because my dad had his own business. Uh, and and my mom says the same thing, not for because of a business, but neither of them ever had lawn signs out or, or stated their political affiliations. Um, so no. No. So where did where did your desire to serve your community in the political arena? Because you could have chosen healthcare, you could have just given back through volunteerism, but you chose in 2018. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, please correct me. But in 2018, you decided to put your name for it for the first election for Ward Six in Norfolk County. Where did that come about? Was it just you saw a desire, or was it something of a passion of yours? No, I, I think looking back on life, a lot of stars have aligned, a lot of things, you know, my passions, my interests, the right place, the right time, all of those things kind of aligned. But like many people, I became involved um, on the municipal level with one particular issue. And that was advocating for a community hub for a recreation facility in our community. I joined a committee um, and uh, it's actually a really, really funny kind of the stars aligned story, but the high level is I, I wanted to be on this committee so badly. I came home from university. I was going to be a physiotherapist. That was my plan. I'm working in a chiropractic office. One of the gentlemen, an influential, um, very generous man in our community came in as a patient and I was like, so nervous. I'm like, this is my shot. I'm going to get on this committee. I'm going to, you know, so I'm, I'm in the treatment room with him and I pitch my pitch and he goes, Oh, we're not quite there yet, but we'll keep you in mind. Thanks. I'm not on the committee. Fast forward several years later, I'm working in the not-for-profit industry and my board chair had to go to Toronto to an awards ceremony and said, oh, I'm double booked. Amy, can you go over to Fanshawe College, there's a presentation on the community hub. There's a committee over there and we want, we need someone to present. I went, I presented, I got on the committee um, and long story short, that brought me to council chambers. I, I started the work. I'm advocating for this community hub. I'm giving deputations, uh, doing a lot of having town hall meetings, seeing that side of the coin um, and had frustrations. The hub is still not built today. Uh, had lots of rejection at council, but it was that committee that said, you should run for council. And I thought, to be honest, I, what am, I can't, I, I can't quit my job. I can't, you know, I'm, I'm not retired. I'm not an older man. Like our counselors were 30 years consecutively around the table. Um, so they said, you should go to a campaign school. 
I went looking for three reasons why it wouldn't work for me. And spoiler alert, you don't go to a campaign school to find out why it won't work for you. Uh, so the rest then is history. I was empowered. I attended another campaign school. I ran, I won. Prior to that, wanting to be on that board and going to that campaign school, had politics been something that you were interested in, like your parents, you hadn't put out the signs or were you active in campaigns? Because the question I'm going to follow up on is, we all remember that first election, that first time you go out door knocking, because you have a sense of what the issues are in your community. But when you door knock, you talk to people at their door, you are you get your eyes open to some of the local micro issues that people are struggling through. So for you, had you had that experience of going door knocking before and hearing those stories or in 2018, when you were door knocking, were you shocked at some of the issues that were coming up? I had not had that experience. I was as green as the gr like I, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was committed, followed through, worked hard and, um, and just prided myself, I suppose, on, on listening. To be honest, I'm not sure that I wanted to win or thought I was going to win. I ran against five or six other candidates in my first six. Going to <laughs> Thank you, including the incumbent. And my goal, my mandate was to turn out the vote and was to encourage other um, community members my age to participate, to pay attention, and, and that's it, you know? So then I started. And then I learned and then it evolved and developed. Um, but no, I just, I, I listened to the issues. I heard what was going on. I didn't have a solution. I didn't have a fix, but I was certainly dedicated and committed to turning out that vote and the door knocking process, but n n no, no experience prior. So five years later, you're four years as a counselor and one year as mayor of your community. Now, um, looking back on it, was it what you expected? was the role of a counselor and now mayor, what you expected from that campaign college and kind of what you had previously known being a green candidate running in a, a, a municipal election? Uh, I don't know that I had an expectation because I don't know that I let my mind go that far to, to securing it, to be honest. But I spent a lot of time and I continue to spend a lot of time on trying to restructure the expectation of what that role actually is. A um, lot of great hardworking community members that have dedicated service to council prior to me, but they were also the type of community members, my, um, the former, my predecessor uh, was excellent at picking up the phone, getting in his car, driving over to someone's house and looking at that pothole with them. Um, and I don't mean that to minimize his work and his efforts. He did a lot of great work, but I'm not the, I'm not the person that's getting, get in the car and come and look at the pothole with you. I'm the person that's going to teach you how to contact our public works department directly to get that pothole fixed for you, cut out the middleman, be efficient, have a better use of our tax dollars and empower the community members on how to, um, maximize their local government and focus on the policy that that's kind of, so for me. I don't know that I had an expectation of what the job and the role was, but I spent a lot of time changing what the people's expectation of the job and the role is. So is it expectation or is it apathy? Because in my conversations with municipal leaders across Canada, the one thing I hear over and over again is there's an apathy with what goes on in the municipal government, how it runs, how it functions, what those sort of rules and responsibility, the jurisdictional rules are, but also how to get things accomplished, how to submit a report to get it potentially fixed or your pothole. Do you find that there is an apathy in your, uh, in your community? And how do you see your role as mayor in trying to address those apathies because you can't go out to every single one of your community members and sit with them and talk them through that process you're hoping that there's an uh, understanding do you find that there is yes and no we are so geographically just different and vast here in Norfolk County and each community in Hamlet is very different. They have their own political flavor and interest and participation level. Um, so we have a very active community. Like we we do get people participating in council meetings. We get a lot of emails. We get, you know, a lot, a lot of social media. Um, and so they're not apathetic in that sense. They're apathetic when it comes to voting. Like I wish we had a higher voter turnout. Um, but I think my role and what I do to 
try to change that is, an, is a broader education piece. And I do a lot of that through social media. And it's um, a kiss of death because you go out on social media and I'm so proud of the work that I've done, especially as counselor, because no one was doing it. No one was, you know, accessible and available in that way. Um, but it really makes you vulnerable and puts you out there in a way for criticism and um, a lot of negativity, but that that's how I do it. And, and I've also hosted a campaign school myself, um, my version of a campaign school this last election. And so, you know, that's a bit of a legacy piece you can leave for your community. That's, you know, not the pothole or the policy that gets changed over later. It's education and involving your community and leaving it better than you found it and driving up, you know, other, you know, other candidates to come forward or just educating the public and how they can play their best role as well. Over the last five years, I'm assuming, and I, I don't like us to assume, but I'm going to assume here for a second that you've had to make some tough choices. And in five years, you have probably come to the realization that you are not going to please 100% of the, your community on every single issue that you make, particularly with everything that the uh, the country's gone through, uh, the affordability crisis, COVID-19, there's just people that you're not going to be able to help, but not help, but uh, appease. How do you see your role in making sure everyone feels like they're being heard in a in a community that is so vast like Norfolk County that you span such a large geographical area that I can imagine you want to try and help everyone, but the people on one side of your community versus the other side of the community are going to be vastly different? Yeah, I mean, you know, to give context for listeners or viewers, we're 67,000 um, people, 1,600 square kilometers um, urban centers, hamlets, villages. So we have five water and wastewater treatment plants, not one large one. We have, you know, multiple libraries, multiple arenas, because each community wants those services and, um, and wants to preserve their own identity. So how do you, how do you listen and ensure that they're heard? Um, just being available, being accessible, making sure that I, I, for myself, I'm having all of those other platforms. I'm on social media. You can, I want it to be easy for people to connect with me uh, and share their position. Doesn't mean that it always works out that way for them. No. Um, but we have a great council in the sense that they will raise an issue, even if they're not in agreement with it. We will have the hard conversation and then vote, you know, the way that the, the cards may fall. But, um, just being how much, how much, to, how much does respect come into play though? Because you, you talked about earlier on about the social media aspect and people vent on social media. And I, I will say that it is a, it is a pool of things that I just don't like to go into for some time to time, but you have as an elected official, particularly as mayor have to sit and listen to people who disagree with you and who have a strong opinion, but they have to do it in a respectful manner. And you have to do it in a respectful manner as well. You can't blow them off and they can't call and scream names at you. Is they there? Can't. A... <laughs> I'm assuming that that's not <laughs> happened in your community there, <laughs> mayor, but how do you do that? How do you, because you are the closest to the people. You make a decision that impacts the people the next day after you make it. You don't go to Toronto. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You're in your community 24 seven. Is it hard to have that respect when you want to just be Amy from time to time? And sometimes you know that when you go out, you're going to have to be the mayor and you're going to have to address some issues that are people are talking about. Yeah, I think as far as respect goes, and, and maybe circling back to your first question was then how do I listen to them? Um, if there's a respectful dialogue, I I love when people come to the table with a compromise or solutions or options. Like if we can't fund whatever it is this year, hey, are you willing to work with me and let's get it in the capital budget for a few years down the road? Or you really, really don't want us to go ahead with this project at all, but you're willing to support it or stay neutral on it if we amend and and do these certain items. I love that. And that's how you can kind of bridge the gap between the, the hard no's and the hard yeses. But the respect thing is hard. And I think for me on a personal level, um, I love my community. And I you go from being a person. You, you are a person. You're a human. You walk down the street. Like I worked in the soap store in high school. And I worked in that restaurant. And um and you're just a person, you're just one of them. And then all of a sudden you're elected and you're not, you're less, you're less than sometimes, you know, and it, it's a hard, it's, it's, it's a hard transition for some, including myself mentally to just not 
um, have that respect when you're you're making these decisions in the community. And I get it. There, there, it's a position I asked for, and I and I got it, and that comes with a lot of weight. But ultimately, the decision was is left to those elected officials. We have to pull the trigger one way or another. Um, and so, does it get easier? Depends on the issue. I think I think it does. I think it gets easier. I think if you stay true to your morals, your values, what you really believe in, and you can sleep at night, um, the decisions still come. They're still lining up for you. You're still going to disappoint people, but maybe you come into yourself a little bit more and and have a better, more confidence, I suppose, in in the whys and the how you got there and the why you're doing it. That part maybe gets a bit easier. Um, but I almost feel like you lose a bit of like, you know, politically, you lose a little bit of, of a political edge as well. When you start to align yourself more with the corporate structure and the corporate wants and the corporate needs, you're less political where you're delivering on the things that the people want. So that's an interesting balance as well. But I, I love this conversation already because you're basically <laughs> taking questions right out of my mouth here. Uh, so I want to, so that's a great segment that I want to jump off on here for a second, because you as the mayor have to move the community forward as a whole. And that means you have to look at every issue as a community issue, but individual issues are important as well. The people who have elected you have their own individual issues. Like you said, that pothole that's in front of their street, park in that area. Maybe they want their library that's closest to them a little bit open, a little bit longer so that the way they can deal with it. How do you see yourself and yourself as mayor in balancing the community needs with the individual needs? Because that is probably the toughest job as a municipality uh, elected official. Well, I guess it's a fine line. You know, what's an individual? If one person wants the library open later, well, certainly the whole community would benefit from that. But it's just one voice. If if the entire neighborhood or the entire school area um, of young families endorses it and they bring a petition for it and they want to see that change, well, then isn't that community? So um, I guess in that sense, I weigh a lot of factors. I weigh the feasibility of it. Um, is it the responsibility of taxpayers all the way out on our West End to fund keeping an East End library open a little bit longer? Is, is that service manageable? Is it equitable? Um, gosh, there's so many other things actually, you know, is it, are they unionized staff? There's so many layers to just executing on it. But um, a lot of the time I find as of late with, you mentioned it at the beginning, the, the, the financial climate, the political climate, we just can't afford to do so much. Anyways, you feel like you're giving out a lot of no's to the community, to be honest. Um, is but it a no or is it we'll look into it? Oh, it's, I mean, 90% of the time it's a we'll look into it. And as it should be, that's the job, right? Yeah. Look into it, suss it out. Is it, is it feasible? Is it something we can actually deliver on? Does it meet our priorities? Um, but it doesn't always come to fruition. And I think that's the tough, the tough pill to swallow. Um, yeah. And, and each community is so, so different. So we battle that, you know, does it, does it benefit over here? And should the taxpayers be subsidizing that here or not? So I think the best policy is to offer those services kind of equally across the county in the best way we can for the most part. How often do you find as mayor, when people talk to you, they just want to be heard because you are the closest to them and they're the ones that probably bringing you issues that are not even in your jurisdictional purview. They're talking about education. They're talking about health. They're talking about passports. They're talking about this, that, or the other, but you as an elected official, as the closest to them are the most easily accessible because often municipal leaders will have their personal emails, their cell phone numbers on their business cards. So you get calls. How often are you finding people just wanting to be heard in a conversation? And maybe it's not even a request or an ask of them. It's just they want to be heard about their issues. Yeah, all the time. I, and that's such an easy one to deliver on. You know, we can we can we can do that. We can hear you out. Maybe I can connect you with someone. Maybe that, you know, your concern is already kind of happening in a small way. Um, maybe there's synergies. Maybe it's something we can deliver on. Maybe not. But at the end of the day, now it's on my radar. And thanks for sharing that with me. People want to be heard. They want to be validated. They want they want the best for their community. You know, no one's asking for um, things that are, you know, really negatively going to impact the community at large. So it's a big part of the role. 
it's a big part. I want to turn to my second segment now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between uh, the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the mayor's opinion. Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing your community today? Uh, two things come to mind right away. The biggest issue facing the community is our financial position. And that's a safe answer, I guess, because it trickles down into all the other issues. But financially, we just passed our largest capital budget in the history of Norfolk County with over a billion dollars um, on the books. And that's not adding anything new and shiny. Um, that's not upping our service levels. That is maintaining the assets we have. And um, more specifically, um, sorry, and, and so we're looking at, you know, tripling our debt, um, maxing out hitting our internal debt limit in the next 10 or so years, 15, 15%. The province sets the 25 25% um, annual repayment limit. And we have our own set at 15 to keep us in check. This is the first year since I've been elected that all of our reserves have been in the black. But one of those reserves is only in the black with $22 to spare. When I first started, many, many, many of our reserves were in a deficit position in the red each and every year. So a billion dollars over the next 10 years with today's prices and we're not adding new services we're not adding better services for the community it's it's a hard one because you can't deliver on much by way of new or improved items and it's not going away anytime soon we're adding you know property tax increases rate increases to the water and there's no end in sight for people um but Right underneath that, our biggest, you know, priority and, and focus of this term of council is water infrastructure and wastewater infrastructure. We're working on a plan called the Interurban Water Plan that uh, helps us partner with our neighbors in Haldeman County and also uh, Six Nations Reserve. And um, it was a part of the provincial government's plan many, many years ago to take in water from Lake Erie, which is what we currently do. But from the Haldeman municipality. And then this plan is built out over several years, but it will bring um, you know, more reliable, more stable water inf uh, infrastructure to our entire community and build out this plan where we have pumping stations and redundancy and you can send the water this way or send the water that way because we've actually been in a water deficit position in one of our communities with a moratorium. And we have other concerns as well. So while we're in a housing crisis, while we're in an affordability crisis, we haven't been able to build as much as other communities have been. And the price tag on the interurban water plan in full right now is around $450 million. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there, but I want a to start lot. with there's I want to start with the big question here. Um, one billion dollar capital budget that is a huge budget, and I can imagine it was a tough uh, negotiations of trying to figure out what the needs and wants of your community are with what's going forward and how the community needs to grow. You're saying right here, right now, that there was no additions to it. It's basically keeping the assets that we currently have, keeping the service levels that we currently have. How hard was that to swallow? Because you, I'm assuming, want the betterment for your community and you want to grow your community, but you have to realize that people are struggling right now and you may not be able to do it on the backs of them. So you have to sort of keep the lane that you're currently in and not divert any potential deviance of 1% or 2%. Was it hard? Oh, it's, 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 it's beyond depressing. It's beyond depressing. I feel for our staff, you know, building out these budgets and wanting to, you know, hear, hearing the concerns and the priorities of council and the community, not to be dramatic. I mean, there's like six new trucks in there and there are some small, small, small things this but year, it's a big thing budget. that you can point to at the end of 2024 and say, look what we got with this capital budget that we just passed in 2023. That's right. We've reduced we've reduced uh, work on the roads. We've we've reduced um, so, so much, really. It's it's getting out of hand. But yeah, it's depressing. It's terrible. But I can't have people calling and saying I can't 
put my kids into recreational sports anymore because property taxes have increased. My water bill is so high. I'm thinking of leaving. Um, and my response to be, you know, I want to give them that listening ear, but I also want to be real with them and practical and share with them that it's not done yet. We're still increasing and there will still be additional increases. And that impacts everybody. Like, you know, you're talking about residential property tax increases. Well, those businesses are still paying it. And the homeowners and the residential who just felt that increase are pinching their pennies now and not going out for dinner because they're trying to, you know, pay their property tax increases and so on. It's so it's, it trickles down and everyone feels it. But the reality is municipalities with, with inflation and the price increases we're seeing on everything, um, quite frankly, whether it's salt on the roads and chemicals to treat the water to the infrastructure you're putting in the ground to development charge changes from the province. Um, we, it, life is, is increasingly more affordable, unaffordable for municipalities as well. And we have to continue like we, we have a, an obligation and a responsibility from a public safety perspective to still do some of these roads to still ensure that our lights are on our taps are running. Um, so when we talk about like the inner urban water plan, it's not because it's a want. It's because we have communities without water. You know, your priorities can't get any more. Before we talk about water, I, I want to ask the very political question right now. And I feel like you'd be up for it because uh, I, I've read some of your interviews and it seems like you don't shy away from tough subjects, but where does the province and the federal government come into play with helping municipalities like yours? Because you are talking about issues that are not just uh, mandated by the municipality, but water is a federal issue as well because there's environmental concerns that you have to look at. There's provincial regulations they have to work at. Where does the province and federal government come into play with helping municipalities like Norfolk County? They are critical for us. Um, and are like, they at the table with you? Um, I mean, we get a, <laughs> we get a lot of, we get a lot of funding as do other municipalities right now. Have we necessarily been the recipient of like site specific funding, project specific funding for water? Not yet. I, I feel optimistic that we are very close um, and we've, we've been working on it for five years and the former mayor started working on it. Uh, but I ran a lot of my campaign on repairing relationships and that needed to happen for Norfolk in a big way, especially on the provincial level. Um, so we, we need provincial and federal dollars to make this plan go forward. And on a really high level, we've sussed out, we have researched um, and studied the inner urban water plan as a build out this $450 million great, beautiful, new, perfect state of the art plan or the do nothing plan. And the do nothing plan is still just as expensive for us because then we're updating and maintaining all of those five separate water and wastewater treatment facilities. Um, so to expect that you could take $450 million um, that typically you'd see growth pay for, right? Growth pays for growth in a perfect world, not the case here in Norfolk when your reserves are depleted. So to put that on 67,000 people in today's climate financially is just not realistic. But here's the kicker. Norfolk County has a lot of rural aspects to us. And so we don't have 67,000 rate payers on the water. We have a lot of people on wells. Um, so we have considerably less rate payers for water and wastewater than we do taxpayers. So that 450 million needs to go even farther once we look at who actually pays for water. It's not realistic. The the provincial and federal government is is a is a need, not not a want and it's dire. We're not asking for a new library or arena. You're asking for water a source of life, which doesn't yeah. seem like is a, a a stupid thing that people would say no to, but here we are in 2023. I want to just discuss a little bit about the inter, uh, inter-urban water plan because I had to write it down because you said it three times and then you were using the acronym. So I wanted to make sure I said it right here. The inter-urban water plan. Yeah. Um, you guys, I can imagine with five wastewater treatment facilities in your community, this is probably something that you, uh, as I say you as the Royal U.S. Council, are dealing with on an ongoing basis. Supplying 
clean drinking water to every single person who is able to attach to these uh, wastewater treatment facilities. Um, but this is not sexy. This is not something that people go, oh, yay, we got a new wastewater treatment facility that costs $40 million or however much it costs now. Last one I looked was $40 million, but there we are. Um, do people buy into this in Norfolk? Do people say, yes, we need uh, upgrades to our uh, wastewater treatment facilities. We need to work on this IUWP plan to make sure that we do supply accurate, good drinking water to everyone who's able to access it. Yeah, mixed bag, because it depends on where you are again in Norfolk. If I talk about Port Dover, my home community, which was the community with the moratorium because of water deficit. Yes, the community wants it. We know a lot of the builders. We know a lot of the developers who have been sitting and waiting. We know that growth is good. We know it's going to support, you know, a, a businesses and so on. So for the most part, yes, that's a priority that's accepted and acknowledged. Um, if you go maybe a little rural, uh, do they do they want their money spent on that plan, um, or do they want to grow and change in their communities? No, you get a lot of that still. Not in my backyard happening. But um, what if someone who's based on a well needs to be put on to town county water and they need to start paying a bill. No, they're not receptive to that, but that's part of the interurban water plan because the more users, the more affordable it is. So it's a mixed bag. On a high level, the community gets it, that we can't stop the growth, that the growth is coming, that it brings benefits um, and that uh, the water's needed, but without a doubt, community members would rather see beautification pro uh, pro um, projects, a new swimming pool, outdoor recreation facilities, tourism initiatives. Without a doubt, they'd rather see their money go to that. So I've been accused on this show of only talking about the negative negatives of communities, and I want to sort of switch this question up a little bit and say, what does Norfolk get right? What do you look at when you go to AMO, when you go to FCM, you say, you know what, you guys could be doing it good. We've, we're have we doing it better. What's that issue for you that you sort of boast about at local municipal gatherings or even in our your own community? Our topography um, and our community, our, our focus on agritourism, agriculture and on-farm diversification. Um, come and tour the lavender farm and, and take a yoga class in it. Um, come and pick your own berries and stay uh, for this particular activity. Our breweries, our wineries, our, our waterfront amenities um, along the lake. Um, we, we do a lot. We do a lot really well, but we do it quietly. And so I think a focus for us moving forward is changing a tourism strategy and uh, building out industry. So providing more jobs and kind of changing the um, the cohorts, I suppose, that, that live here, you know, making sure we're not a retirement community and keeping young families here, but supporting the retirement community that is here, all of those problems that everyone faces. But that's our, it's our topography. You're, you're, you're so close to putting your toes in the sand on the beach or you're on your bike on the trail or you're at a world's biosphere or you're drinking a fresh pint, um, you know, on a farm. You've mentioned one subject that I'd like to talk about, and it's my third segment, and it's tourism. I think tourism mm -hmm. is something that municipalities play an important role on, but I think we don't often tell our municipal tourism stories uh, on a national stage. And as I have listeners from across Canada and around the world, I want to know, what are some of the hidden gems in Norfolk County that you don't often hear about when people say, oh, we're coming to Norfolk County, we're going to go X, Y, and Z. But what are the hidden gems that people should see while they're there? Well, I touched on it. So I think Long Point, we have a world biosphere, which is, it's phenomenal. It's the most interesting piece of land with one way in and one way out over the causeway. And, you know, it's nature, but we also have the provincial park with with this beautiful black purpley sand on the beaches yet in Port Dover, it's a different color. And um, so Long Point, the biosphere, taking in nature, the bird watching, that is a for sure must see. Um, I think people know us about the water, about the lake. So I'm not gonna go into that one. The boating amenities are there. Um, Where do you go? Where do you go with your family to just get away and just sort of have a little escapism within your county? 
my husband and I go to the breweries. We really <laughs> like our breweries and you can travel around to so many different ones and catch them all. We also have some really cool, you know, shops and antique finds and in Waterford and in Port Rowan. And you can make a day of, of some just, you know, mindless kind of wandering around a beautiful, beautiful trail system. The Lynn Valley Trail, which connects us into other municipalities. Um, so, but I'm not on the trail. I'm not exercising. So I'm at the brewery. And um, yeah, and, and community oh. events. We do that really well. Every weekend in Norfolk, you can find a festival, a fair, a parade, you name it. So I'm going to throw you under the bus here, but let's see if you know. So this is going to be airing uh, literally Wednesday, uh, the 21st of November. So that's next week. Uh, what's coming up this weekend? What's coming oh. up next weekend? That people who are listening in your neck of the woods, they're saying, maybe we should do a little drive out to Norfolk County this weekend to go see what the mayor's just told us to come out to see. Well, this weekend, they're going to miss it, but it needs an honorable mention. Santa Claus is coming to Fort Dover, um, and he arrives by boat on a tug. And then we have the Santa Claus Parade. Uh, we also have a lot of great live entertainment and music uh, happening. So in Delhi, in one of our little communities, we have a beautiful old theater that's been repurposed into a restaurant community space. And Tim Hicks is coming to play. Uh, Finger <laughs> Eleven was there last week. We're doing some fun stuff. Um, but next weekend, you are putting me on the spot because I, I will cut this. I will cut this part out for the, it's you the quickly... Norfolk County staff Christmas party next weekend. <laughs> so thank goodness. After you... that, we're right into Christmas season with, you know, tree light up ceremonies in Port Rowan the first weekend in, in, uh, December, the Delhi parade. Oh my gosh. Panorama back to the tourism question or the, the hidden gems look up Wellington park in Simcoe panorama it is the whole park is lit up by volunteers and community members and it stays lit for the entire month and it is the busloads of people will come in grab a coffee a hot chocolate and walk around the park so that happens on december 2nd i have one last question for you and then i let you go because i know you're very uh busy and i assume that you've probably taken enough time to, to answer some questions from a podcast host but i want to know in your opinion what makes Norfolk County such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? It It's the people and the culture. Um, and I know the people, again, is the easy answer, but it's, it's the, it's, it's the vibe. It's the culture. It's the way that we support each other, encourage, um, you know, each other, build, support small business and, and, and so on. So it's a really welcoming, inviting community as a county as a whole um, to come and try to open a new business in or um, bring your family to. It, it's really a wonderful, lovely place. And I also think our diversity uh, Port Dover is different than Delhi. That's different from Port Rowan. That's different from Waterford. And um, so we have a lot of diversity in, in all of our communities that you can find something for everyone within a 10 or 15 minute drive. Um, we really value our history, our heritage and our culture. So as we grow and evolve, we keep our stories alive. And I think that is a beautiful thing that doesn't always happen. And, um, you know, lastly, our proximity, we're off the beaten path. We're, we're 45 minutes from Hamilton, an hour and a half from Toronto, 35 minutes from Brantford, um, not far to get onto a four series highway, but we are off the beaten path. So we're protected and we're, um, we like a little bit of that quiet, uh, keep to ourselves in some, in some sense. So we have, we have everything we need and a really great supportive community, um, with some with some cool stuff going on all the time really really proud of our community and, and what the work you see coming out of our volunteers and our user groups we're uh we're lucky amy i want to thank you i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down over the last 40 minutes and talking about this uh it's always uh it's always a pleasure to sit down with engaged municipal leaders like yourself and people who truly have a passion for their community who truly have a passion to make their community better so thank you for serving your community and thank you so much for appearing on the show oh thanks chris i really appreciate uh what what you're doing as well i think it's it all it's, you know goes back to the education piece that i mentioned with my social media and um it's you know obviously interesting for us but i appreciate your time as well great questions and great conversation 
Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape communities from across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our show. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. If you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can continue to deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.